good time of sharing with one another. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 25 out of the ESV. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me, before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected rejected him because I have rejected him looks. I have no idea why, why, is that right? I have rejected him. I don't know where that extra word came from. All right. Um, For the Lord sees not as man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was a ruddy. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you again for this opportunity to, to share with one another as we look through your word and and see what you are saying to us in our day and age, even through this narrative. Father, I thank you for the time of study that I've had. I pray this evening that as we share with one another, that Holy Spirit, you will lead us into all truth. The applications may be different from one person to the other, but your truth remains unmoved. Father, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, that you never lie, you never change, you never turn, and who you are. 
and we thank you for that. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, um, I've made about eh, maybe a page and a quarter of uh, some observations and some notes, so uh, we can go through those. And if you want to stop me along the way, please raise your hand vociferously so that I can see you, because if I'm looking down, I probably won't see you. Um, so, or you could clear your throat or just throw something soft at me. So, all right, one of the first things that I, I noticed here as I went through this is, is that God has rejected or has spurned um, Saul as his choice as king. And we know that he's done that because um, Saul has greatly, um, even from the beginning. Yet even in the fact that God has rejected Saul, Samuel grieves for Saul. Now, it, it's interesting, um, you know, for a lot of us in the Western world, um, in some cultures, grieving is very silent, um, whether uh, it could be of German heritage or uh, some other heritages where people who grieve, it would maybe be a little difficult. Uh, in, the, in the Middle East, grieving is um, a little more active. Um, the idea of the word here for grieve um, has the idea that it is expressed through vocalizations, tears, and ritual expressions of sadness. So even though Samuel knows that Saul has sinned, and because of the sin, God has rejected him as king, Samuel is still grieved for this young man. Um, it's, it's interesting to me um, that whether it's in this case, uh, God rejecting Saul, or in other instances where we see people turn away from God, uh, for God's children, it really should cause us to grieve and to intercede for those people who have either walked away from God, or in this case, um, God has rejected. It, it, it's not that Samuel has said, well, Saul sinned. Oh, well, I'm just going to move on to the next person. Samuel had, for whatever time they had been together, had a real affection for Samuel. Um, one commentator said, um, it says that Samuel's grief uh, on account of Saul's rejection is, uh, is accompanied by earnest prayers for his restitution, showing that he had amiable feelings for the young man, even though they were at variance with his public duty as a prophet. So even for those who have fallen away from God, they, they do not, I, I guess when I, as I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, sometimes um, we can be kind of harsh on people that have fallen away. Um, and I, I see here in, in Samuel a good example for us to grieve over those who are separated from God, um, to intercede on their behalf. It doesn't mean that God is going to answer the prayer, but I think it is a right reaction by God's people to intercede for those. And we, we see that in the New Testament. Um, Jesus looked at Jerusalem and wept over them because he wanted to gather them like a hen gathers her chicks. Um, you know, Paul said that he would basically said we would give up his salvation for the salvation of the Israelites, for the Jews. Um, and I see in this something that's, that's something that, that I really pray that God will have in my heart is that it breaks for those who are separated from God, that we would pray on their behalf that for restitution, for repentance, for a right relationship with God. Um, so I, I saw that as, as very interesting and, and uh, something that I know that for me, I need to make sure that um, I am praying in that way for those that I know that are separated from God. The other thing that I find interesting here is that um, God really does understand our fears. God says to Samuel, you need to go and anoint a new king. Samuel says in verse two is, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, well, tough it up, get the oil and go. Is that what he said? No, it's interesting. In Hebrews um, chapter four, verse 15 says, for we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You know, Jesus Christ lived as a man. He did so without sin. It says in that same passage that he was in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Uh, he knows that it's difficult. Um, and Samuel had a real concern. People probably would talk. If, if word got back to Saul that Samuel had anointed a new king, more than likely Saul was going to have Samuel killed. And is Samuel a child of God? Yes. Is he a little bit afraid of the process of getting to see Jesus? Yes. You know, I, I think that's a pretty human response. And, and we know that Samuel is a godly man who listens and hears God's voice. Um, but I, I find it interesting, God's response to him is the Lord says to him, he's, he's just like, you know, okay, he, he doesn't say you have a valid point. He just says, here's what you do. Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. So one of the things that I thought was, did God instruct Samuel to lie? No, he just gave him a way out. He did go to sacrifice. What did you say, Diane? I like, Okay. Did, a gave, a gave him a way out or a way in? <laughs> yeah, James, you said something, and then Van? Okay, he gave him a cover story. We'll, we'll maybe in, go in depth on that a little bit. Dan? At first glance, I mean, I'll be honest, I'll say disingenuous because the real reason he's there is because I'm his king. Mm -hmm. tells him, well, you know, he did do a sacrifice, I get it. But the reason the sacrifice was to appoint him as king. Yeah. I know that got into the way, but when you first read it, it appears that way. Yeah. He, he I think sometimes I'm not I'm well hopefully we'll get to the end is like, you know, our idea is that you tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, right? So Samuel did tell the truth, but he didn't tell the whole truth. Jeanette. You, you, you get the idea that people were not typically happy to see Samuel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think sometimes, because I, um, you know, it, it seems like when, um, I'm trying to think to get this coherently in my head, which is not always easy for me to do. Um, but I, I, thought, I like um, watching like mysteries and like murder mysteries. And inevitably, not in every one, but a fairly routine thing that will happen is the, the police will find something out and say, oh, is this true? And like, well, yeah, it is. Well, why didn't you say something before? Well, you didn't ask me. And, and I confess in my little inside voice, I'm like, no, you're supposed to be telling, you know, everything that you know. Well, uh, when I was... Um, I'm not saying this is an equivalent. I wasn't anointing anybody as king, but the few times or several times that I went to court, the attorneys would always tell me, answer the question, 
no more, no less, right? Answer exactly what they ask you. Don't provide them extra things. Uh, when you go through a deposition, it can be challenging. Uh, I know I went through like an eight hour deposition, ask a lot of same questions, is to remind yourself, I'm answer their question. So I'm not lying. If they don't ask me about something, then I'm not obligated to tell. So as one commentator said, said that Samuel told the truth that we may consider it not the whole truth, but he was not bound or called upon to tell the whole truth. Yes, Mrs. Flanagan. Yeah, I don't think it would have served him wrong. They asked if you're going to sacrifice. By the way, I'm annoying you in front of Jeffrey to be king. Yes, that yes. Yeah. yeah. And this is just something I just thought of it while um, we were talking is, is that Samuel goes, he goes to do the sacrifice and he's, he's going to do something. He's getting, you know, two for the price of one. So, um, but it talks about the fact that he consecrated Jesse and his sons. Yet we know that David was out in the field with the sheep. So did David get consecrated? And what is the impact of not being consecrated? Um, if it was, well, I'm a, this is my, just my summation because I didn't think about it until just now. The priests were consecrated with this whole ritual thing that went on. So I'm thinking for this, there was probably some, it's probably not the right word or right phrase, Reader's Digest version to consecrate them so they could participate in the sacrifice. Um, but I almost get the sense that the sacrifice was already done and now they're sitting down to the meal afterwards. Um, so perhaps that wasn't necessary. And I, I don't know why that didn't occur to me until while we were talking, um, just kind of struck me, he was talking that, that he consecrated everybody else, um, but we don't see, and, and maybe he did when he came, I don't know. Um, but I, I think sometimes, um, I see your hand, James. I think sometimes, I don't know why, if it's just my personality, but my, my first thing when I read that, I was like, did God ask him to lie? I mean, is it, is it to not, it's just, and I'm, obviously God doesn't, God doesn't lie, says he doesn't lie. He, he never sins. He doesn't make people sin. But it's just an interesting thing that he does give him a cover story, but I don't know. Just it's just one of those things. Is like, uh, but anyway, uh, James and then uh, Jeanette. Yeah, it, it could be. I don't. I don't know. I, since I didn't think about told just now, I didn't take the time to. Uh, didn't have a chance to look into the thing. Uh, Mrs. Flanagan and then Mrs. Ferguson. Right. Yeah. So it's um, it's something that you know, as I was studying over the last couple of days, just kind of pondered about that. You know, it, it to me, it's in a different realm than Rahab, who actually did lie because she did. She knew where the you know the spies were, and that's a whole other discussion. But it was just like he told them the truth. You know, when they nobody bought, no, nobody asked. 
So what are you here for? I'm here to sacrifice. What else are you here for? And he said, what are you here for? And when he said, yeah, I'm here peacefully. I've come to sacrifice. They were so relieved that he wasn't there for any other Yes, they were so relieved that, that the only thing that was going to die that day was an ox or a heifer. So, um, Mrs. Ferguson. Well, he did ask, I mean, like, David was out watching the sheep, mm-hmm. and they got all the sacrifice ready. And then he did say, was there somebody else? Like, before they even had sat down. Well, but. Like if you were having, you know, grilling hot dogs or something over a fire. And then yeah. he said, oh, by the way, where's Catherine? Oh, yeah. Catherine's over there. You know, well, I, I think the difference would be is uh, if I understand your sacrifices, the, the meal usually came after the sacrifice. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't be grilling. They wouldn't be grilling hot dogs. They would not be healing. They would not be grilling hamburgers either. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, so this is something interesting to talk about. So anyway, so he, you know, Samuel did tell the truth. So then, and and I think this is a passage that we're all very familiar with if we've been in the church very long. This passage in verse seven, where you know, of course, Samuel had they had Saul, tall, good looking, you know, warrior like looking person. And so he's going to Jesse's uh, house to look at his sons, and out comes the son, um, um, Eliab. Um, Eliab, and what does he see? Someone probably cut from the mold of like Saul, tall, good looking, you know, this, you know, the, the, and he's like, he's, he, and even though we say like, don't judge a book by the cover or don't, I mean, let's face it, you know, boom, he walks up and Samuel's like, good choice, God, I can see this. And, and God's like, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord on the heart. So, you know, we do this, I think, all the time looking at people's appearances. We are in our culture and most cultures, I think, even though we may have varying um, standards for, say, beauty, we, you know, have in our mind what someone who is, you know, presidential looks like, or someone who is, you know, a, a states, states person, what they look like. And as I was looking through this, and I was thinking about this, is that for us in our world, this applies to so much more, I think, than simply people. I think we can often be deceived by appearances. You know, we, we look at things and we go like, oh, look, it must be, look how successful they are. Look how, I mean, it's part of the reason why, you know, um, stores remodel every, I think, five to seven years because people shop first with their eyes. Let's face it, you, you, go, you go into a grungy looking store you're you're like, "Eh, this place might be sketchy. But if you go into a nice, clean, palatial looking, uh, see if anybody gets this reference, Stuff Mart, um, uh, you're like, oh, this must be a good place, you know? So we, we, people know that's that's kind of how we judge things. Jeanette, did I see your hand go up? Oh, we are, okay, never mind. Swatting away a fly, sorry. Um, um, But I was thinking like, even in the Christian world, you know, we look around and, and we look at uh, ministries or churches and go, they're successful. We're going by appearance. And yet God is still looking at the inside. I can still remember it's been years ago. Um, we would try to, and I think probably our, we, we want God's work to be um, in his eyes successful here. And sometimes we would read books by people who seem to have some level of success. But what we found by reading a lot of these books is that their success wasn't based upon God. And sometimes their success meant that things in their ministry were contrary to what God's word said. 
You know, it's, I, I read this thing, interesting thing about the nation of Israel. Israel, the more successful they came, the more idols they built. The, the, the more prosperous they came, the more pillars they built or high places that they built until they were just completely apostate. It's, it's almost like in our, um, in our humanness, as we quote unquote gain success, we begin to read our own publications and suddenly begin to think that somehow we did it. Um, I know ever since I can remember, um, the elders here, we've always prayed that God would do something that, that nobody would ever think we could have accomplished because we don't want any credit. Um, but, but I think we in our world have to be really careful to not be deceived by appearance. Because I, I think that, I, I see, uh, the scripture describes Satan as an angel of light. You know, he, you know, a lot of times we see him portrayed in things as, you know, ugly, horn, tail, whatever, but that's not him at all. You know, um, it, it's, you know, our eyes can deceive us and we have to dig deeper to make sure that we're getting the truth. Mrs. Flanagan. And, and the Jews are just like us. They listened to those warnings and took them to heart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, I think it's in Proverbs. It's like, you know, um, the idea that like not being so wealthy, you think you don't need God, but so poor that you curse him, you know, having enough. Um, but I, I just, I just thought it so we, we are so, I think about what you see in advertising. You know, it's it's all about feast of the eyes. You know, uh, you've probably seen ads too, where you get to the end and you're trying to figure out what in the world are they advertising. I'm not really sure what they're advertising. They had they had this music and they had some attractive person, but I I don't know what they were advertising. Um, which maybe even more so now uh, with uh, some of the ads that we have. I get to the end and I'm like, if they didn't put up at the end what they were selling, I probably be like, well, wow, that was pretty artistic and well made, but I have no idea what it is they want me to buy, Mrs. Ferguson. Well, um, so the question is basically, did Samuel tell Jesse, I want your sons to pass before me, and when I find the right one, I'm going to anoint him king. I'm almost feeling, and as we go along, we'll probably find out I'm about to be wrong. I'm, I'm almost thinking he didn't. Because if you're a dad, who are you going to want him to pick? The firstborn male, the oldest one, right? Now, what's interesting is, is David, and I do find this interesting, David has beautiful eyes. I have no idea what color that, but I, I did find that interesting. He's like, he's got beautiful eyes. He's handsome. So he, he you know, it, it, it's not like God's like, I, I picked the quote unquote ugly duckling. But reading the description of the first man, what is it probably is true about David? And we'll, we know this as we go further into the story of David. David is probably what? Short of stature. Remember when we get to David and Goliath, Saul's armor is way too big for him, right? And even though he's, he's Jesse's youngest son, look at how they describe him when they're like, when Saul's looking for someone to play an instrument for him, a man of war. Um, uh, let's see, um, skillful, um, of course, if just taken out of context, skillful in the liar, that would be, you know, if you didn't know what a liar was, you'd be like, what? Um, uh, he's skillful, um, 
Uh, let's see here. I say, a man of valor, skillful in playing, man of war, prudent in speech, uh, a man of good presence. Some translations say good looking. He's, he's you know attractive. Um, if I'm looking for someone who can play, that's probably where I would I would stop. It'd be like, oh, he can play good. I really don't care about the rest. But if you're a king who's going to be fighting battles, having someone who has this, and this is something that was it, it, is something I. I always try to remind uh, the young people when I was teaching them, is sometimes the struggle is, is, is David was a man, but we don't really know how old he was. More than likely, though, he was over 13. I, I think more and more, and I think we're all aware of this, you know, now you're not really an adult until you're like 50 or something like that. I don't, I don't know what age it but I mean, it used to be like, you know, hey, you know, in our country, 18 was when you got to adulthood. Um, now it's gone later and later and later. But in most of the world, 13, 12, 13 is, is the age when, you know, you're expected to, I, I don't know, uh, different, uh, probably is a better way to put it, but hold up, uh, uphold your end of the bargain. And, and honestly, reading some of the stuff as my wife homeschooled, in a lot of cultures, if you could walk, you were watching the baby. You know, if you could tote them around at all, if you, in some cultures, two, three, four years old, where we'd be like, oh, you can't possibly do that. You know, like, oh, they're just a child. Like, oh, no, you know, you can sweep, you can go out and get the eggs. There's all these things. And so I don't know exactly how old David was, but it, one thing we do know as we read further in, in the story about David is he can fight off lions and bears. He's good with a slingshot. He's not afraid. Um, but I, I think from this, he's probably not the tallest person. He's probably not the tallest tree in the orchard. Um, so he's not thinking. And, and, then, and I think the other thing, maybe, Diana, this could be completely wrong. Maybe why Samuel or in any case Samuel didn't tell him is that Jesse didn't bring all his sons. He just, he didn't. And I mean, because he's like, if, if, I think if Samuel had told him, he might say, like, hey, somebody run, get your brother. Um, you know, Samuel's already passed you by. Run, get your brother, have him come. Um, Right. Yeah. So, and that was my next point is, is it seems as we look throughout scripture that God's pattern is to use the unlikely over the expected. Um, whether it's in Acts chapter four, uh, where the Pharisee Sadducees looked at Peter and John and were amazed by their boldness um, and they perceived that they were uneducated, uneducated common men, and they were astonished. You know, and, and sadly, even in our own culture, we can be like, you know, like, oh, they, you know, if they don't have a college degree, we think less of them for whatever reason. Um, there are very successful people who have college degrees. There are very successful people who don't have college degrees. Um, so, but it's interesting because I, I love this. Um, and First Corinthians 1, 27, 29 says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So, you know, God does this thing. Even in Paul says, I'm not a trained speaker. And yet God, what was Paul's main job? Speaking. But he was like, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, he even said, I think in, in um, 2 Corinthians eleven sixty says, "I'm an unskilled in speaking." He, he you know, he wasn't an orator, um, and yet God, he was the main speaker. You know, yes, Mrs. Flanagan. Yes, he called uh, called Moses to be the, the main uh, the speaker, and of course, Moses. Well, no, Moses, just, just like the rest of us, the the man of a thousand excuses. Um, so God kind of, you know, helps him out there. And yet Moses led the people. And, and, and I think it's one thing that, um, so this is the thing that I was thinking about, even though it says God chooses what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. I don't think what God is saying is that God uses quote unquote fools. So, cause to me, the wording is interesting is, 
what is foolish in the world. So the world may see somebody as a fool, somebody as uneducated, somebody as untrained. And yet, you know, and back in Acts, but they, they knew that they had been with Jesus, right? So um, God is not opposed to people who are skilled, right? But we have to make sure that we want to work in God's economy. And, and we see this sometimes inside the church world where and when we say like, you know, in the idea of women becoming pastors, a lot of the church world bases it strictly on skill. You know, but they are the most skilled people. I've heard this argument in like Japan. There aren't that many men. There's way more women. So the women do it. I hear this from mission organizations that like, we don't have enough men to go. So we'll send women um, to do this. And, and I'm not sure that we're doing what God wants us to do. Um, because what you're doing then is you're allowing women to have authority over men. And I've often wondered this, is a woman an authority teaching a man not to have a woman, to allow a woman to have authority over him ever seem kind of awkward. Now, do I think there can't be women missionaries? I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying they can't be sent all over the world and evangelize, but once people get saved and they're brought into the church body, there needs to be men who can, that sounds weird, I didn't think about that before, mentor, mentor men. Anyway, um, we need to have men. And perhaps if God has not raised up any men, it's not something we should be doing. And I, I know some would probably have heart failure over that, but you know, I, I, just, I just struggle. We, we can't violate scripture in order to quote unquote accomplish scripture. Um, so, and, and, you know, in our world, we have men who are licensed and ordained, but we have men who teach and preach who are not quote unquote licensed and ordained. God uses men to teach inside the body of Christ. Um, he doesn't um, put those requirements on the church for ordination or licensure. Our culture kind of in a way does that so that we're sure that they've been vetted um, and some other things, but I, I just, I just love God's pattern, you know, and I, I, I'm not going to speak for Dan, but I, I know like for me, I am mystified. I, I, I would probably be the second to last person I would ever pick, but that's how, that's how God works. Um, and you know, why does God do it that way? I think because then it's his power that's being shown. If if the most persuasive person in the world does it, maybe they're thinking, well, it wasn't God that did it. I could I could sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo in the dead of winter. So maybe it wasn't God. But it just I just find it I find it interesting. Um, oh man, we're gonna run out of time. At least one more thing I want to talk about. In verse 14. It says, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So uh, harmful um, uh, has the idea of having or exerting a malignant influence or an evil influence. Uh, the word from, uh, believe it or not, means from, ah, imagine that, um, or on account of. And the word tormented, and it's used several times in this passage, means to terrify, to fill with terror, to frighten greatly. So, anything strike you about that verse? Before I talk about what I what struck me, maybe you'll get to it first. Yeah. It, it, not just distressing. The, the, to fill with terror, right? Other translations say evil spirit. Yeah, the, um, the word harmful, the, the word could be translated evil, but it, uh, it, we all know malignant, bad influence, bad influence. But the tormented part, the tormenting is to terrify. Um, obviously, a good spirit probably would not, well, should not terrify us. Um, it's interesting. It's from the Lord. The Lord 
sent it. So what questions does that bring up? What, 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 what things does that, what questions does that bring to your mind? Why, why did God think it was necessary to terrify him? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't know. Um, I, the question that came to my mind was, isn't it wrong? I mean, God doesn't sin. But somewhere inside me, it's just going like, man, that, that, and, and, and we've said this before, I'm not God. You know, but at some of them, um, as Dan would say, if I'm brutally honest, it seems wrong. Um, Mrs. Ferguson had her hand up first and then well, Mrs. Flanagan. I don't know. I'm thinking weird, so I don't know if it's right or not. But um, it says, now the spirit of the Lord has departed Saul. Or he didn't even realize that Saul actually had the spirit of the Lord the way he well, acted. Yeah, well, we talked about before, comes and goes, so ebbs and flows. did it do that, the evil spirit come into Saul because Saul had found out about all this and he was tormenting, he was tormenting himself? Or, the, well, it says then that the Lord tormented him. No, the Lord did not torment him. Well, from the Lord, it, the evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking that a lot of it was in Saul's mind. That a lot of it was his. Okay, we'll go with Smithus Flanagan and then and then Mr. Sowers. Mr. Flanagan, nice and loud. One, one thing we need to remember is that God is the creator of hell. Yes, he is the creator of hell. So to think that he only has happy thoughts in law only and he would think are good to everyone is not who he is. He does bring judgment. Okay. Yep. And uh, and fortunately, wonderfully, our God is faithful and true, and so whatever He does is right. Yep. Now Allah is known for not being; but He's known as the great deceiver. Mm -hmm. That is. Um, but just He's not known for being yep. true or faithful. Mm -hmm. So even though it kind of throws us off center. He he will be sending myriads of people yeah. into a crisis. I think for some it can throw them off center because for so long we've pounded the other side of God, the non judgment side. Um, at the end, like uh, even in Israel uh, and um, Hosea at the end, they are restored, but there is some harsh judgment to drive them to repentance. Now, but, you know, was there, you know, I don't know, I, I can't say I know the mind of God, was there hope that Saul would repent? Um, uh, it's, it's also, I, I don't know, some, uh, one of the comments talked about, like, was it a, a possession thing, like, you or could a evil spirit torment somebody without necessarily having to possess them? All right, Mr. Sowers and then Marie. Nice and loud. And I do, and I do get the sense that th this his Saul's inner circle have been around him. They've heard Samuel's words to him, 
and it is it, it is true. Uh, it's a good insight to say, like, even the people around him knew that the evil spirit had come from God, that the Lord had sent him. I think in our sometimes in our Western mindset of how we want God to be, what we want God to be, that we look at and go like, ooh, mm, no, I got like. Like I, I'd heard somebody say, like God never punishes. I'm like, really? You might might want to read the whole Bible before you decide. And and you know what? He even punishes his own children. They're you know not not to the loss of salvation, but you know Hebrews pretty clear. You know if he loves you, he's you know. But I think we we have such this horrible view of punishment. You know, but it, you don't get punished for doing right. You know, what as we've been studying First Peter, you know if you if you suffer for doing right, that, that's a huge, that's, God sees that as wonderful, but if you suffer for wrong, he doesn't. Marie. Yeah. God, God was showing Saul's true nature. So, so this, as I was studying, this made me think of the sermon, uh, the message from this past weekend that God opposes the proud. And this is what it looks like. And you know what? I don't want to be prideful because I don't want to be on that side of it. Um, yes, Mrs. Flanagan, and then I'll give you guys homework. Not a three-year-old. It's the God of creation. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, can I jump to the last verse? <laughs> That's your homework assignment. Yeah. I was. I, I, that's the backside. Is is to talk about um, how God uses music. Um, and how he has wired us for music and, and looking at verses in the New Testament, the Old Testament, that God has uniquely wired for some reason in the human psyche, the, the music. But think about a movie without music. You know, it's, you know, our emotions can be in some sense manipulated, but like in this, I, I even know when I've been, I, I remember when I had my first surgery, has all those complications, how soothing music could be to remind me of what God has done for me. You know, so is that, that's your assignment. Look at, so, so review in scripture how music and people are intertwined in God's plan. Ephesians 5.19, Acts 16.25, Colossians 3.16, James 5.13. Study it out. We're, we're never done. Um, so, oh, uh, Mr. Mueller wrote, said, I think God uses this distress to bring Saul and David together. Yes, it's true. All of these free will choices and God's sovereign plan brings them together. Um, uh, let's see. Saul earlier has also shown uh, fears man more than God. Yes. And that's uh, one thing is. Uh, can be hard for us to remember because we don't necessarily see God, but we see that guy right in front of us, and uh, that can be difficult. So, all right, very good. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be free to move about the cabin. Uh, Don't you, Father, thank you for your word. Lord, um, I, I, I confess I don't always completely understand, and, and Father, that's okay because you're God. I'm not. I'm finite, and you're infinite. Um, and I'm not even sure the word infinite does justice to who you are. Lord, again, thank you for your word. Lord, may I rejoice that you are on my side. I am your child. Father, for anyone who might hear these words, Lord, would you 
please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, draw them to yourself, that they might be one with you, and that they would indeed be with you forever in heaven. In the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray, amen.